Hello and welcome to another informative Connectionology webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your host, as always, Executive Director of Connectionology, Ginger Jarek. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to have an incredible webinar today. We've got Justin Kahn, we have Dustin Herman, and um, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, you definitely want to make sure you get out your notes. However, we are recording, so we'll be able to share this with you after the webinar as well. And um, you will have the opportunity to ask Justin all sorts of questions. So at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A box where you'll be able to add those in there for him. And then also, I want to thank all four of our incredible partners. Later on in this webinar, you guys are going to meet HMR, Fast Funds, On Point Legal Nurse Consulting, and Strategic Relationships. And I'm very excited about that. But we're going to go ahead and get started because we have so much to cover. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our amazing moderator. Many of you guys know and adore Justin as much as we do, um, but he actually works with Spangenberg, Shibley, and Library Attorneys, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. But prior to that, several years ago, he actually worked with our beloved John Romano out of West Palm Beach. Um, so I'm sure that you guys probably know him a lot you know, from being around in Florida. Um, he's been named a top 100 trial lawyer by the National Trial Lawyers Association, and he's also been a rising star with the Super Lawyers. He's helped attain a $28.5 million verdict in his very first trial, and he's also a co-author of The Anatomy of a Personal Injury Lawsuit. So if you've not read that book, go check it out. But we are so excited to have Dustin with us. We're going to have a lot of fun, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him. Thanks, Dustin. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you very much, Ginger. And look, we have a really special uh, program for all of you uh, today. Justin Kahn is an amazing trial attorney. He is a in the courtroom verdict getting trial attorney. He handles the toughest types of cases that we can handle product liability, medical malpractice. He is actually board certified, one of the very few attorneys who is board certified in medical malpractice. He's going to talk to, you, to us today about neuroscience and visuals and getting things um, uh, before the jury in a persuasive way. And he's literally the guy that wrote the book on evidence. And I think he does this on a, a yearly basis, but he writes a, a book, an annotated book on civil procedure in South Carolina and, a, and a, an annotated book on the rules of evidence in South Carolina. So this is a lawyer that you're really going to enjoy. He knows his stuff, and you're going to be able to get information that's going to be able to help you in your practice starting tomorrow. And so I encourage everyone to pay really close attention uh, and probably have to go re-watch this because this is a information-filled seminar. So uh, Justin, hand it over to you. Uh, look, really looking forward to this. Just let me know where I'm supposed to send the check <laughs> for, for that introduction. The um... All right, the, I want to talk about trial by visuals is sort of the concept I like to think about is how we can present information to a jury visually to be more persuasive and not to, just to a jury, but to judges as well. And so I'm going to talk about some of the neuroscience principles behind how people process information and how you can, how you need to be aware of it so that you can appropriately take advantage of it to do the best you can for your client. So I'm gonna cover some theory, some ideas, and give you some examples. And I've read a whole bunch of different books, and this is just a selection of them. And you'll see none of them have to do with law, because I think it's very important to understand how this information can and should be presented to individuals and take tips from graphic design, from neuropsychology, and neuroscience and try to figure out ways to better present this information. I also, of course, read all the great philosophers like uh, Sophocles, Pericles, and of course, Testicles. Usually when I'm in a room, I can hear the laughter, but uh, I can't. <laughs> it's tough to, hear, tough to hear. So one of the things that I'll always try to convey to lawyers is you know, don't be afraid to try new things. And the only way you are going to be comfortable trying new things is just to go out and do them. Yes, you may fail, but you still got to try in order to uh, push your boundaries. So I always like this um, saying from Sarah Turnbull, if you don't stretch, you don't know where the edge is. And that's the same 
is true as a trial lawyer. You know, there's a particular rule of evidence. It's got the same words in it for both sides, but if you don't push where the edge is of that rule uh, to try to have the most impactful evidence in trial for your client, you know, you're, you're not really um, living on the edge. So what I'm gonna try to cover is three different main areas. I'm gonna talk about some theory and give you some examples about that. And then also give you some tech ideas. And Dustin and I may both um, pop back and forth at that point, talk about IPVO and showing you some examples of how to use that at trial, mediation, or in a deposition. So let's talk about how the mind processes information. Most people think, well, I just see it and I get it. It goes to my brain and then I immediately get it. And that's what they think. It goes from the eye to the brain to the idea. But as we're going to learn, that is not the case. It is not that simple. There's a lot of things taking place uh, before you have the idea that you are not aware of. And I'm going to cover, my goal is to give you some examples in order to make you aware of the fact that you're not aware of what you're not aware of. So this to me is a good example. And, and in the background of this, was, so the reason for me wanting to show you this is that you think you are saying something to a jury or a judge and they immediately get it. And my goal is to let you see examples where you understand that is not necessarily the case. And that just because you hold up or have a particular piece of evidence come in does not mean the jury immediately gets it and has the right idea. And we're gonna talk about why, but we'll, we'll look at a couple of different examples. The audio might be low on this, but I'll talk over it if you can't um, hear it. So the first video- Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. And just you know, we're not seeing the video. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, at least you told me. How's that for tech? All right, let's figure out why that is. Well, hey, I can do it another way. I'll uh, let's do it this way. I'll play it in the window. What I'll do is this. I'll we'll share my desktop, and then we'll do it and see what happens. How about now? Watch what happens Got if it. an unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. The young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white-haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. <laughs> like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. Approximately 50% of the people approached in this study didn't notice when the person they were talking to was replaced by someone else. So, and that, that concept is called um, change blindness. So think about that. I mean, you, and, and to me, the reason why it's an important idea is that you, when you present something to the jury, you think I'm saying it, they're getting it. But what's going on is the particular person uh, that happened in the study, their limited focus or their attention was focused on somebody has asked me for directions. That's the task I need to help them with. I've agreed to help them with it let me help them with it. So they start to focus on that task and they're not paying attention to all the other details, who the person is, whether it's a man or woman, just generally they're holding a piece of paper and they've asked me for directions to a particular place. I'm thinking in my mind where that place is and I'm going to give them that information. And this door comes by, the person changes and they're not aware of that because they're focused on the task or, or the, um, the idea about they need to work on the particular words to put out the story of where the, to give the appropriate directions. So to me, that's just one example, and I'll give you a couple more about how the mind processes information in a way that you think is, that you don't perceive being aware of, that you need to be aware of. That just because you're talking to a jury about a particular thing doesn't mean they're going to perceive that thing in the way you want them to perceive it. 
So I'll give you a couple more examples and we'll talk about the ramifications of that. All right, so the other one is, and some of y'all may have seen this before, but. Players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. I love that second version of this. Well, and to me, the cool thing about it is this, in terms of why I think it's so important for a trial lawyer, is that it's, that concept is called task blindness that a particular person is focusing on a particular task and they're so focused on that task they become unaware of other things that may be just as important or more important in the case and so i like to use that example when i'm talking with lawyers to make sure they understand that they need to tell the jury what their task is you can't just assume the jury understands what their their task is you need to tell them because they may think their task is something else and because they think the task is something else, they are not focused on the evidence that you are presenting and how it goes to present um, what you need to present in order to make your point for trial. So that to me is the idea about that task blindness is don't assume the jury understands what their task is. Make sure that they, um, make sure you tell them and don't feel bad about it. Remember, you've been working on the case for two or three years. At one time, you didn't remember what was important in the case. And you have to remember what it's like to have it uh, see it with fresh eyes. So let's go back to this. So one of the things, you know, this what I'm trying to help people think about is this concept of focus on attention. And the idea is to help you get the optimum amount of information targeted where it needs to go so that the jury doesn't end up missing the gorilla that you know is there, but they may not see because they're focused on another task. Another thing is, and we're gonna talk about how this weaves into uh, presenting things. The, um, when I start putting up things on the screen, you think, oh, I can handle this. Well, the reason why I put that particular um, slide up with all those words is, as I'm talking, you start reading through the slide and that, tension is divided between you're trying to read the slide and you're trying to listen to me. And I'm going to talk about why that's bad and how to avoid that. And so that, that's why I throw that slide up there. But I'm going to talk about multitasking because everybody thinks, oh, I can handle it. I can take in all the information from different places and process it appropriately. Uh, there was a university, and I, I can't remember which one, that conducted this experiment where they had this guy, it was a, a clown on a unicycle going around the middle of the uh, sort of the middle of campus. And as people walk through the quad area, um, they would pass by this clown on a unicycle. And after they got through the area, they were then asked the question, did you see the unicycling clown? And when two people were walking together, there was something like 57%, why it wasn't 100% blows my mind, but whatever. 57% of the people uh, did see it. If somebody was listening to music, then only 32% of the people saw it. If somebody was by themselves, 32%. But if they were on their cell phone, it was only 8.3%. And to me, the important idea about this is 
that no matter how much you think you're dancing around like this clown on a unicycle, if the jury's not paying attention to it, then it has no effect. And you need to always be aware of if a people walking around don't see it, I mean, why it's not 100% all the time blows my mind. But if they don't see a clown on a unicycle, then that gives you a clue about how humans process information, what they are really paying attention to. And so you as the attorney who's presenting information to a jury need to make sure that the attention is properly focused in order to uh, use it appropriately. And this concept about multitasking goes back to even 1740s when um, Lord Chesterfield wrote a letter to his son saying that there is not time enough there is time enough for everything in the course of the day if you do but one thing at once, but there is not time enough in the year if you will do two things at a time. So the idea is that I mean, for a long time, people have known you cannot multitask, don't think you can. So we've talked now a little bit about attention and some of those principles. We're gonna move a little bit into some examples about how you can be more confident. And I'm gonna start talking about how to design slides and information to present uh, to have a jury learn better. Uh, Amy Cuddy wrote a book called Presence where she conducted, she's a social psychologist who was trying to help MBA students, I think at Harvard, try to prepare for their interviews better for their on the job inter for interviews to get jobs. And she had half the students who were going to be interviewed unknown to the interviewer make themselves big for a couple of minutes. So they did a power pose. They held their arms up, made themselves big like a star. So they held their arms out and you know whatever those make themselves big. And what she, what happened was that the interviewer perceived those people, even though they did not know they had done this power pose for a couple of minutes ahead of time, they perceived those people as being more confident than the people who had not done that power pose. But in addition to that, there was actually a physiological change that took place in those people by making themselves bigger, that the testosterone levels went up and cortisol, which is a, uh, a stress hormone, those levels went down. And the cortisol levels associated with fight or flight, and when that hormone drops into your brain, you can't think straight. All you can think is, how do I get out of here? And so the ability to control these hormone levels within yourself to give yourself more confidence, I think was a fascinating, um, I'll call it experiment. And I've thought about doing things like that and I've done that with clients that I'm preparing for depositions. Uh, when Just before they do the deposition, I might have them get big <laughs> um, outside of the presence of the, uh, the lawyer on the other side. And the same thing when you're going to court, if you're nervous about appearing in front of a judge, make yourself big in the bathroom for a couple minutes and um, see if that has an impact on the way you present the information to the judge or how they perceive it. And what cortisol is, is if you think of it as nature's built-in alarm system, it's your body's main stress hormone. This is a slide that I would suggest to you is wrong. Don't do slides like that. We're sort of moving into how you can present information better. What you ought to be doing is using as few words as possible and then using an image. So you're basically doing a verbal voiceover. If you were going to explain to the jury what cortisol is, you would talk about how it's your body's main stress hormone and that it works in part of their brain to affect mood, motivation, and fear. And it's sort of like your nature's alarm system. And so when I'm doing this verbal voiceover with just these images, and as we see as I talk about this topic some more, it's a more effective way to teach and to persuade. Justin, one of the coolest things I learned about cortisol is that when there's a small baby crying, the moms get the cortisol boost. The dads don't get it. <laughs> and that's why they freak out and have to go tend to the crying baby. And we're going, what's the big deal? Just let it cry. Well, that's interesting. It's a, the uh, sound would affect different, well, the mom differently than the father. That's interesting. Yeah, really, really, really interesting. But cor it's cortisol, big deal. I have too many other jokes to say that I won't. <laughs> uh, I was like, I 
Hmm. Oh. So it should be up there, right? As I go yep. past this. All right. It, now, just the opposite happens when you, you know, sort of, I'm trying to figure out how to happen. If you have a closed, I'm trying to figure out how to work it into what you just said. The opposite thing happens when you have a closed pose. When you make your body smaller, it can have the opposite effect. People will perceive you as not being, as being less confident. And this is the way that I always try to remember this one. A very close call. Could have gone either way. It was right on the line. He's not too happy with it, I can tell you that much. He's beating him like a rented mule. <laughs> and the rest just tuning him in. Boy, who do you train to take a beating like that? It's a one-time part, Scotty. Is that the thing I called a marathon? I don't know what that has to do with your cortisol talk, Bernard, but... <laughs> oh, either, but it's funny. <laughs> All right, I like that. One. Um, so let's so, and we'll talk about it in a second that how that juxtaposition creates meaning uh, later on in the talk. But uh, let me get back to we're gonna start talking about now multimedia learning and how you can use that. So uh, there's a professor out in um, California named Professor Richard Meyer who's written for more than twenty years about how students learn best how can we as an attorney as a teacher as and he really directs his books and information to teachers but to me the same ideas apply which is how can you teach best he's a psychologist who studied learning and he's investigated how people learn best do they learn best by being provided words or do they learn best by being just given images and unsurprisingly, it's a combination of both that he sort of addressed this idea of, is it best to use words and pictures? And he has found it's best to use that. So when you, when, when you as a lawyer are designing your slides or presenting information, think about ways to use words combined with pictures. And we'll talk about why that is in, in this book of, he wrote on multimedia learning. He talks about these two different um, channels of, I'll call it input. You, you take in information visually and you take in information verbally. So you hear things and you see things. And you as a presenter of information as a teacher need to be aware of the fact that there's these two main channels of the way information travels from you to the hearer or the person who you're trying to instruct. And we'll talk about what happens if you overflow those two channels, how learning goes down. He calls that concept cognitive load. So whenever you increase the load on the brain to take in information, if I'm simultaneously presenting verbal information and visual information to you, or too much of it, or too much verbal information, your, your cognitive load goes down. When I showed you that slide earlier that had all those words on it, while I was speaking, it interrupted while you were reading those slides and you didn't know what to pay attention to. Were you supposed to pay attention to what I was saying or were you supposed to pay attention to the slides that were up? And like right now, as I'm talking, some of you are probably trying to read what this particular page says. And that's an example of why it may be dangerous to put things up that are not needed when you are presenting information to a jury. So I'm going to give you an example now of a way to try to make you aware of this sort of conflict that goes on between the verbal and visual um, processing parts of your brain. In a moment, I'm gonna show you some words. And the words are in fonts of different colors. I want you to say to yourself as you are looking at these words, don't say what the word is, say to yourself what the color of the word is. So here we go. So say the color of the word, not what the word is, how it's written out. And as you try to do that, what you're noticing is that it's difficult. There's a sort of a stuttering that takes place and that's called the Stroop effect. And it's a type of, it's a, this is a psycholinguistic test. And it, what's happening is the portion of your brain that processes words is interfering with the portion of your brain that processes colors. And I've given you a task, which is 
having you try to um, it creates a conflict between those two areas of the brain to try to get that information to me, which is the color of the word versus the words. <clears throat> so that's the Stroop effect. And another idea is this concept that we're going to talk about is the, it's called the split attention principle. And what happens is when you, as the presenter of information, create cognitive load, when I give you too much information at once, when I overwhelm you with images and blow ups all at once, not segmented as we'll talk about, I'm, you're, I'm increasing the cognitive load. And when I do that, learning goes down. So as I increase the cognitive load, the learning goes down. And that makes sense. I mean, you can only pay, as we've seen, you can only pay attention to so much at a time. And when I give you too much to pay attention to, your ability to take it in and do something with it goes down. So a couple of the big ideas that I have about, um, and we'll talk about sort of ideas about creating slides for presenting information is this one. I think of slide creation as easy, something as easy as PI. And PI, the acronym is point, image, emphasis. What is the, think to yourself when you're creating a slide, what is the point of the slide I'm creating? That what, what's the point of it? If it has multiple points, it may be too much and you may be increasing cognitive load and it may not be a, as effective. So think to yourself, is there just one point I'm trying to make with the slide? <clears throat> is there some image that I can use to help make the point? And is there some point of emphasis that I want to call out on the slide to make my point? So when you're designing the slides, think to yourself, um, how can I make it as easy as pie? So one of the, <clears throat> a couple of points, a couple of other sort of theories about multimedia learning. I mean, I've got a book that's like an inch of the written of about this stuff. So these are just a couple of the principles I think that lawyers need to keep in mind is there's a concept called coherence. And people learn better when extraneous material is excluded from the images and slides. And now as you are the audience hearing this, put yourself in the role of a jury. How many slides have you put up like this for a jury to read while you are talking and rereading the language that's there? And you see what happens. There's this conflict. You know, am I supposed to be, I'm interrupting your reading. Why? But it's got to be important, so why else would I put the words up there? And decrease cognitive load, get rid of the words, just do the verbal voiceover, tell the jury. Coherence is this concept where if I give you too much information and put too many words up on the screen, your ability to take it in goes down. And now your mind can process the verbal information from me and see the picture to the extent it has something to do with what I'm saying and your, the learning goes up. So that's the idea of coherence. Another idea is segmenting. And the idea of segmenting is to break things down into pieces, into bite-sized pieces. Because if you present too much information, the cognitive load goes up and people just don't want to have anything to do with it. So if I said to you, look, we're going to learn about networking, and here you go, this is, this is the issue we got in this case, most people would shut down right away and go, oh my God, there is no way for me to get that. Versus starting it off by explaining, we're going to learn about networking. Maybe you've said to yourself, how is it that I can get the internet access on my computer in my office? Well, here's how it works. You have the internet out there and there's a wire that comes into your office that's connected to a firewall. And it come, that information comes through a firewall, which helps block certain bad information from coming in and also block certain information that you don't want to leave your office from leaving. And that all goes through a router. And what this router does is it's a box which actually directs the traffic in the office. It's like a traffic cop in the office. It'll direct information to a switch. Maybe you have a server in the office or if you have a Wi-Fi device. So all that information goes from the internet to your firewall, which keeps things from going in and out that should not be. And it goes to this router, which then distributes the information. And then it goes to the various computers and other devices in your office. And when you explain it like that, and then you go back to this picture, it makes a little more sense <laughs> when you start describing it to people. But the idea is first to segment and break it into any bitty pieces and present the pieces a little bit at a time in using these metaphors and these simple pictures, uh, the idea and the ability to process it and understand it goes way up. Um, one of the things that 
I, I named this seminar some I can remember um, neuroscience and technology. There's actually been studies that say when you use brain images. Now this is um, researchers, researchers who use brain images in their research, the credibility of that research goes up. <laughs> so I think we as lawyers need to uh, think about how the, we can use MRIs or other sort of brain studies with the jury or with experts to increase our credibility. Uh, people tend to find more credible whatever it is you're gonna present when you talk about using neuroscience research and uh, brain images. Now, where we've been sort of heading is, some of y'all know I like to do magic tricks. And there was a famous magician named Tommy Wonder <clears throat> who, when in one of his books of wonder, he had a two volume set in the forward or in the introduction, he talked about the idea that there's no such thing as misdirection. That is a magician is never misdirecting the audience. It's all about the control of attention. As a magician, you want to direct the audience exactly where you want them to be looking. You are not misdirecting you are at all times controlling exactly where they are looking or what they are paying attention to. Now, I think as a lawyer, the same idea applies that you must always direct and think about ahead of time how you are going to direct the attention of the jury to what you want them to pay attention to. And so your job is to control the attention of the jury at all times. And so we've talked about um, understanding attention and I've shown you a couple of examples of it. And um, so now it's hopefully making a little more sense. I'll, I'm gonna talk for a moment about pre-attentive processing. I can't remember what time is, I can't remember if Ginger's supposed to do something at 1.30 or not, or 1.35. Uh, well, she'll chime in when. Okay, all right, no problem. See, I'm trying to, see I'm paying attention to all these different things going on around. <laughs> So let's talk about pre-attentive processing for a moment in terms of how you can use it as an attorney when you are creating slides or graphics to use in deposition or at trial. What pre-attentive processing is, it is, I'll call it a, for lack of a better word, almost a biologic or neuro, neuro, neurobiologic way of processing information even before you are aware of it, especially visually. There are certain neurons in the back of your eye and the retina and around the retina and that process certain kinds of visual information before the brain even gets it. And those kinds of pre-processed um, items or these pre-attentive attributes, things like length, you're able very quickly to pick up on uh, these discrepancies in length. You can see right away that this object is uh, taller. This one's thicker. There's a different orientation size pre-attentive attribute. When you enclose something, it has a certain significance. Where things are positioned, even the use of a color hue can have an impact because you immediately see that and focus on it, or the color intensity. So we're going to talk about, in terms of pre-attentive attribute, let's talk about the use of color in um, how you might present information to a jury to help decrease the cognitive load to make what you are saying more understandable. Let's assume you've been working on a uh, case for, you know, for two or three years to get ready for trial. And this slide shows exactly what you want to prove, which is the number of sevens is what your case is all about. And if the jury gets it, then you're fine. And you say to the jury, look right there, just see how many sevens there are. That's our case. And you know, you're, you're making them try to find them versus using some of the pre-attentive processing why not make some of the, um, the font gray and the ones that you want to stand out, make them white. And that, makes, that decreases the cognitive load. They can immediately see the sevens and they can certainly see all the other information, but now you've helped them process that information and make it more digestible and easier to pull out pre-attentively. So now let's talk about that in the context of a deposition. I mean, how many times have you put up a deposition to a jury to look at and say, look, that's my point right there. 
Now, for, you're assuming multiple things when you do that. One is you're assuming a jury even knows what a deposition transcript would look like or what to do. I mean, most people wouldn't even know what, what are, they may say to themselves, where are all these numbers in front of this thing? What's that got to do with anything? You know, the Q&A they might get. So why do that to yourself versus take the deposition transcript and using the pre-attentive processing of changing the color hues a little bit, highlight the or emphasize the words that are important to your case in this or using this sort of technique or this idea. So here's the deposition transcript, but it's a lot easier to see and to process. And what you are conveying to the jury is, boy, very quickly, they're saying this person is talking about like an ice skater sliding in the back of somebody at 45 miles an hour. So I see Ginger popped up. So yep. I'll yeah, I thought this would be a great point. Um, just real quickly, I wanted to just take a small break because I wanted to introduce everybody to two of our amazing partners. I'm sure that many of you guys have already met Leon Branham with Fast Funds, but if you haven't, he's here to tell you guys a little bit more about what he does. And um, he's coming to us all the way from New Jersey. He works with clients all over the country and he is such a great resource. So Leon's kind of like the guy that you know, you call and he can help you. He can give, I mean, instantly. And this is just not even just with fast funds, but he's helped me out several times when I need something. And I'm like, hey, Leon, can you do this? And it's done. So he knows people, guys. So definitely get in touch with him. And uh, he's going to show a little bit more about what he does right now. It's because I'm from New Jersey. I, I got a guy. <laughs> I got a guy. So. <laughs> yeah, but whose beak is getting wet? <laughs> I was wondering, how totally. is it you always? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Good to, see, good to see you, Justin. Good to see you, Dustin. Howdy, howdy. Right. Um, okay, so I will, uh, this is um, without the benefit of seeing Justin's presentation. So all my slides are um, the exact opposite of what he's been talking about uh, up to now. So um, for the purpose of uh, introductions, if you're not familiar, Fast Funds is one of the first, uh, the original litigation funding companies that started the industry nearly 25 years ago. And what we do is provide non-recourse funding uh, solutions for attorneys and plaintiffs on an individual case-by-case -case basis. So it's like a financial David versus Goliath, where the plaintiff attorney has to cover their own expenses on every case up front and on a contingent basis. And the defense has all their fees and expenses covered by deep-pocketed insurance companies. So this creates a culture where the defense delays case resolution and will attempt to outspend you as a tactic for your client to accept less. So what's a plaintiff attorney to do uh, when you know, they're coming against a fully funded defense? Well, some attorneys will self-fund, uh, and but self-funding is somewhat limited, right? You can only fund so many cases at a time. And what do you do about your other cases? And what about overhead? And what about marketing? Uh, many attorneys will look to refer out a case, which is great. Um, but if you're not covering your portion of the expenses, you're going to give up an additional portion of your, um, your recovery, uh, your fee. Many attorneys will try to uh, stretch their dollars with less expensive experts. Uh, but as the saying goes, when you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. And good experts are worth their weight in gold. Uh, many attorneys will go to a bank, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but a bank is a place that uh, will give you an umbrella when it's sunny outside and they'll ask for it back when it rains. Uh, that's because they're regulated, right? And they can't value your most important uh, asset, which are your cases, because they're on a contingent basis. And unfortunately, you know, you have to, sometimes you have to be realistic and attorneys will sometimes accept less than the case is worth, but they live to fight another day. Well, there's a better way. Uh, we've developed a product to help the plaintiff attorney cover expenses on individual cases on a non-recourse basis. So what that means is uh, there's no personal guarantee, there's no lien on your portfolio of cases or your attorney fees. This allows you to invest in more of your cases now by engaging the right experts where they're needed most, whether you need to prove liability or damages or uh, just you know, button up your, your, your case. So what you're able to do is maximize your results. Uh, we're not here to tell you how to lawyer. We're here to support you in your lawyering, lawyering cause. So you decide what your case needs and what experts you use. And we're just here to su support you financially. 
And uh, we've worked with many uh, attorneys, as Ginger said, we're nationwide. We've worked with a lot of folks in connectionology. We've had a lot of great results. We've heard a lot of great success stories. And we'd love for uh, you guys just to give me a call. I'll put my information in the uh, chat box and let me know how I can help. And uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Leon. And I know people are going to be wanting to get your content information. So thank you for putting that in the chat box for everybody. Um, and again, just save Leon's information. I'm telling you, you might need him on something later on down the road. He's, he's your guy. guy. Yep, he knows guy. <laughs> <laughs> and now the guy who I'm about to introduce, um, Connor McDuffie, who works with Strategic, he can actually find people. So he can find ex-employees. He can find people that will help you in your cases that you never thought was even possible and literally change your entire case. Um, so I'm gonna have Connor tell you guys a little bit more about what he does right now as well. Hey, Connor. Hey, Ginger, great to see you. Good to see you, Justin and Dustin. Um, yeah. Thank you for that introduction. So yeah, that's exactly what we do. We specialize in identifying ex-employees of your corporate defendants and then flipping them into insider witnesses or whistleblowers. And the way we do that is a two-step process. The first step is producing what we call an EEL or an ex-employee list. This is a list that contains the name, job title, tenure, and then confirmed contact information of these ex-employees. Uh, right now, we're averaging 33 names per list. And all we need to source this information is the name of your defendant, the types of employees that you're looking for, and then a relative time period within to search. From there, once we source your list, we can launch our interviewing team and our interviewers will call and vet every single person that we identify. Uh, they're really, they're gonna start a relationship with these individuals, they're gonna find out what they know, and they're gonna get them to become sympathetic towards your case and your client. Uh, these ex-employees, they know your defendants in and out, they've seen that negligence firsthand, and they're willing to talk about it, whether they're disgruntled or not. So it's a really, really powerful tool that you have at your disposal. Um, it is really detrimental to your defendants. So I have redacted exemplars of our EEL, our ex-employee list that I'd love to share if you're interested. This one is specifically from a nursing home case we did a while back, but we handle all types of cases with attorneys all across the country. Um, we're also capable of identifying class reps for your class action lawsuits. So um, I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. I'd love to share this redacted exemplar with you. You can call, text, or email me anytime. I'm going to put my information in the chat box below as well. Thanks, Ginger. Yeah, thank you so much, Connor. And uh, we appreciate everything you do. You guys have a great team over there. And I appreciate the fact that you're helping all of our attendees too. And I appreciate our attendees reaching out to you. I've been getting a lot of um, calls from everybody lately. So thank you for everything. They both do great work. I recommend everyone contact them. They really, really are good, good people to work with. Yeah, appreciate that, Dustin. Thank you so much, Ginger. All right. I'm going to hand it back over to Justin. All righty. Thank you. All right. Thanks. The, um, what? Is this? So let's talk a little bit more about how the uh, mind processes information and trying to get some things out of the way. I've got two screens and trying to, all right. So, how let's think a little bit about how the mind processes information. The uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of people, and I want you to tell me who has better better personality traits. So here's the first person. Here's Adam. So here's his personality traits. I want to have you quickly look at him and sort of think to yourself, what do you think about Adam? Then I want to show you Sarah. And I know that was quick, but that's okay. So. Real quick, you know, say to yourself, well, who, who has got better personality traits? Sarah, I mean, she's sort of got this stubbornness. Uh, um, she's envious. Um, she's critical. I don't know if I care for her, but uh, this other person, Adam, seemed to be okay. He was intelligent, industrious, and so on. And he seems a little better. Most people would say that. But what happens is the order creates meaning. And the exact same words were used to describe both people, but they were presented in a slightly different order. So most people would perceive Adam as having better personality traits than Sarah, even though the exact same words were used to describe them. And the point of that is that order can create meaning. So everybody's got 
bad facts in their case. If they've got a plaintiff's case that was going to trial, there are bad facts you got to deal with. So what this starts to teach us, and we'll uh, give you a couple of examples, is that you can actually try to mitigate the bad facts by presenting some good facts first, put the bad facts in, and then follow it up with some other good facts. And those bad facts sort of become lost in the good facts. So we can talk about another sort of example is the context creates meaning. So if I showed you these letters like this, you would very quickly say to yourself, ABC, what's the question? But what happens when it's presented like this? You probably say, well, 12, 13, 14. And what is going on is the context is driving some of your decision-making. So when you saw just the A and C clearly, and you saw this, you probably went, well, there's two letters here. That's A, that's C, that's gotta be a B. And we saw the numbers, you saw the order and you said, well, it's gotta be a 13. But if you look, they're the exact same, um, I'll call it character, but it's the context that is giving it meaning. So again, when you're processing information, the context can have a big impact on how the overall perception of things that are sort of fuzzy or not as clear. There was a famous Russian um, filmmaker in the early 1900s who wanted to test out how people perceived certain video clips. Uh, they weren't video, they were actually literally film clips. Um, how they perceived different things and what was going on in the audience's mind when he cut between the face of an actor and what the actor was purportedly looking at. So, and this is, the effect is called the Kuleshov effect. And so he would show, he showed the audience a bowl of soup, then had the actor's face and would ask, what is this actor thinking? People said, well, he looks hungry. He showed a different group, this young girl lying in a coffin and say, what is this actor thinking about? They say, well, he looks sad. And they show this lustful woman in the couch. And what is he thinking about? He's thinking lustful thoughts. But the images of the man were the exact same images, but the context was changed by what came first. So if you showed food prior to a face, people thought he looks hungry. If you showed a dead girl in a coffin, then showed the face, the, the I'll say the jury, the audience perceived him as being sad. So the whole point is that order can create meaning. And when you are presenting information to a jury, you need to be aware of, you can't just say to yourself, well, all the facts are what the facts are. Presenting the facts in a particular order can create a good meaning. But if you take those exact same facts, and present them in a different order, it can create a very different meaning that may not help your case. So whether you focus group that information or, or test it with people in your um, office or friends, how you organize the facts to present to the uh, jury and audience can have a significant impact on what they get out of it and what it means. So now let me give you an example of what I'll call a verbal voiceover for an image or for a series of images and to show you the, the impact that it can have. So imagine this is sort of a, a, a end of a at the end of a trial and it's a time for closing argument. And I may put up in front of you, the jury, the following. We all remember seeing this image of Sarah. This was taken on her 25th birthday. And we heard the testimony about how much she loved nature and loved nothing more than hitting the mountains, exercising and riding her bike, listening to the sound of the rocks going underneath her tires and breathing in that cool, crisp mountain air. Then you remember we had the testimony of the crosswalk she was in when she had the right of way and was walking across the crosswalk when the Walmart truck driver who had the bad record that we've all seen and heard about drove through the red light. And now the only wheels Sarah will ever operate are these. So just look at the verbal voiceover and the description I'm giving. These are images I got off the web. I mean, right. They're not, they're not part of any real case. I just put them together in a particular order and gave you the verbal voiceover 
and you are building a story in your mind based on why you're looking at the images and while I'm giving you the words. I mean, that's the power of your ability as a true storyteller to create and evoke images and feelings and mood and everything else in the hearer or the audience. So I would encourage you to start playing around with the use of images and we'll give you some more specific examples, but I wanna show you the power of that sort of to culminate. You notice there was no, there were no words on that slide. There was no words on the screen. It was just the images and me just me giving you the story about purported testimony. So now we're gonna to get to uh, a couple of things about how to present better. And I love this slide. This comes out of a book called uh, Presentation Zen by Gar Reynolds. And what stood out in my mind when I read his book uh, 15 or 20 years ago was the idea that you as the attorney never, or the presenter of information, never wanna be that person. You have a lot of important things to say what in the world is your audience going to remember about this when you've got, when you give them all of this um, verbal vomit, what can they possibly get out of it if you're trying to shove it down their throat all at once? So at all times when you are presenting information and when you're designing the information to present to them, always remember your audience. Think, what would it be like if I was sitting down hearing this for the first time? What would help me understand it? And along that same vein, Gar Reynolds talked about, he contrasted uh, two different presentation styles of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And he asked this question, you know, who, who presents, who persuades better? Bill Gates, who's standing there with a bunch of color, colors and words behind him with the closed pose that we talked about. What, what is the audience getting out of what he's saying? Are they, is there something important about digital lifestyle? Is he... You know, what, what are you supposed to be paying attention to? What's on the slide or what he's saying? Versus someone like Steve Jobs who would take the stage and have a blank screen when it was appropriate and would, hey, I'll, I'll say, <laughs> the, uh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't know I was in a seminar. <laughs> the, um, uh, versus somebody, who, so Steve Jobs would just get up there with a blank screen and then present the information verbally and then from time to time use images. And, uh, the, the other question to ask yourself is, and make yourself aware of, is how, why bullet points are boring and bad. So if you see somebody like Bill Gates presenting, you would see the series of bullet points there, and you didn't know what was important to pay attention to, what he was saying, or what the particular slide had up there. And if you were um, watching this stuff, were you supposed to be um, reading ahead at the bullet points while he was talking and not knowing what to pay attention to, and it creates confusion. So the idea was, or is, to not simply put up a series of bullet points, to get up there and verbally present the information with some images and do the verbal voiceover to convey your story. It's kind of emblematic of the, the differences between PCs and Macs. <laughs> that funny. Oh, you can't see it. I got my original Mac right here. Oh, you can see the cutoff. Because you know. I've been a Mac fan for a while. But I like that um, idea and that concept because to me, once you see that slide, you, you don't, you, uh, hopefully you get it. And you think to yourself while you're presenting this information, how can I do this better? You know, what would Steve Jobs do? So, so one of the other things that I thought he did well, Steve Jobs, was it's, it's almost like what a lawyer does. You know, he would identify a problem, he would present a solution, and then he would show how it works. And I would suggest to the extent you can make something like that work in your case to try it out. And I'll give you an example of what he did when oh, a long time ago. He stood up in front of the audience and said, how many times have you been sitting in your car and you're leaving your house, going down the road, and you went to listen to that music on the CD and the CD that you wanted to listen to was in your house and the CD player in the house. Or how many times were you in the house and you wanted to listen to a certain song, but the CD that you wanted to hear was out in your car and you had to get up and go get it and turn on the car and get, eject the thing. 
he said, you know, why is it, it that we can't take, I mean, all this stuff is on a disc, which just contains digital information. Why can't we just take all this digital information, put it on a device that'll fit in your pocket and listen to music whenever we want to, whenever we want. And that's how he introduced the iPod to the world. So, and then he showed everybody how to work through the thing. So he presented you with a problem that you didn't even know necessarily you had, or maybe you hadn't thought about. He presented you with a solution and then walked through how it would work. So um, I, I suggest that you as a lawyer should do that from time to time is to engage the audience is to identify the problem, present a solution, then show how it will work. This is a slide I like to show people to point out why bullet points are not meant to replace what you say with text. So you can just read what the bullet points say. Rather, they should emphasize one or two points and just put up the bullet point and explain to the jury or, or explain the jury, explain to the audience, you know, why bullet points are bad. Just use the image and do the verbal voiceover for why bullet points are bad. Now, another concept that I think we lawyers can borrow from visual storytellers, the people who produce Hollywood movies, is the concept of storyboarding. When Hollywood goes to make a movie, they don't just have a script and somebody goes around with a camera and just starts randomly shooting things. They, ahead of time, draw out in a storyboard fashion what the various scenes will look like. So the and and from the point of view of where it will what the camera angles will be, and so if you think of a storyboard concept and apply it to your case, what can we learn from Hollywood? That's a really cool idea. Why not storyboard your closing first? From the moment the client comes into your office, think about what you are going to be putting up as part of your closing slideshow and what images you are going to be showing the jury to make your point. If you think about your closing first, then as you are progressing through discovery, you're thinking to yourself, what images can I get? What do I need from my client? What images do I need from the opposing expert? What images do I need from my expert? What images do I need from my uh, client's friends or family or coworkers, whatever it is? What pieces of the story can or am I going to need for the closing? And in what order am I going to put them up? And once you start designing your closing first, then your case just is just about getting all those pieces admissible throughout the trial so that you can then tell your story at the end. So that, I think that's a cool sort of idea about storyboarding. You know, a couple of lessons we can buzz through real quick. For There was a famous um, study by a guy named Tufty. His last name is Tufty, who analyzed um, some of the information presented to NASA when they were deciding about whether or not Columbia should come back into Earth's atmosphere. And they had these certain slides um, in which he criticized, like, what the hell were they trying to say? They had the word significant appeared several times, but what does that mean to the, to the engineers hearing it or seeing this word? You know, what is it? There were these vague terms there. How was, the, how was an engineer who was watching or looking at these slides supposed to do something with this information? The use of the, um, they had feet per second, cubic things per inch, you know, these other things that may or may not be understood or translated, that information uh, could become lost on the people who needed to make the important decision. So again, remember your audience when you're using slides this is sort of fun when, and I'm not suggesting you use just images because this is an old FEMA logo that you know, it looks like everything at FEMA leads to disaster. That's probably not exactly the idea that they were trying to convey, but you need to, just because you use an image doesn't mean it's going to work. You need to think about the ramifications of what the image is. I think Dustin liked that one. The, uh, it's another thing to do is, you know, you have spell check built into your presentation software. How about you know, use that? Don't feel like you need to put every single word into whatever it is you're going to say on the slide and just to carry it over to the next slide. You know, remember you got spell check. Don't just because you have the ability to use all kinds of color schemes and funny letters doesn't mean you should be doing that. Um, and if you have a bunch of stuff to say with data, you, know, you can go overboard and create.
create all kinds of problems when you try to convey too much information with data and you start putting up too much information, the jury can get lost. For reasons that I'm not sure of with Zoom, the slide builds weird. I'll have to figure that out. So imagine presenting all this information to the jury and you as the lawyer think, boy, this is really important what y'all pay attention to. And the jury's like, I'm not sure what it is I'm supposed to be paying attention to. There's a lot of data, a lot of bars there. Um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be paying attention to. And if, even if you try to point out to them, you know, look right here, you know, this is where the really important thing is. Um, yeah, let me stop sharing a second because somebody said they're having a problem with audio. I think the, the slide for, I want to take the slide out of my talk from now on. It, I think it does funky things. All right, I can hear you just fine. Okay, well, somebody said they had an audio problem. Oh, no, wait, this particular slideshow, for reason, uh, this particular slide series, with Zoom, I have found in the last four weeks does something funky, and it builds funny, so I'm going to need to start taking it out. But So what I'm going to do is get to the next, I'm going to move to the next series of slides. Um, my keynote, for some reason, doesn't like this slide. Let me get to something. I've not had this problem this long with this slideshow. So let me go to this. And another, this actually brings up an interesting point um, as I'm presenting. If you ever have a tech problem, which you ought to assume you're going to have, there you go, look at that. And, th and that was fun. So if you ever have a tech problem at trial, the best thing to do, in fact, let me first, let me take these slides out. I'll get rid of that. So that's just, um, is to be prepared and not react to it. I did what you should not do, but I did not know how long it was going to last. And given the, um, the format, I can't fix it. But if we were at trial and something like that were to happen, well, I could just go to an object and hold it up and start talking about it. And the jury would not know that I was having a, presen a presentation problem. I would act like there's no problem and pull up an object or pick up some blow up and start talking about that. There's no batteries required for blow ups. And so always be prepared for your technology failing in the middle of trial and have blow ups ready to go. Know what to do if your presentation fails and how you react to it um, can impact what the jury thinks. If I acted like there's no big deal and just went and picked up a blow up and I've had this happen at trial where something cuts off that I know is supposed to work and it does not, I'll turn to somebody who's with me who knows what's supposed to be happening and I'll just go pick up a blow up and start talking from there while they're fixing it. But if I react like, oh crap, what the hell is happening? Then the, all the jury is like, what, what's this person doing? So just walk through it and don't worry about it. So let me go back now to the slideshow. I want to give you some examples of specific things that you can start using at trial um, or in depositions. So one of the things that I think is important is this concept that juxtaposition can persuade. Think back to that beer commercial where you had the juxtaposition of the man being yelled at by the coach juxtaposed with him being yelled at by his wife and how that created meaning. So in a case I had against AutoZone, um, I know nobody will be surprised my client tripped and fell here. Uh, one of the things I was uh, trying to show was that, and that when this happened, it had rained. So all this area was covered up. So when she was walking from her car this way, she couldn't see all these cracks and all these other problems. Ended up hitting her head on this concrete bollard and fractured her skull and immediately has seizures and brain damage. So what I wanted to do was compare the customer entrance to the corporate entrance. So I just thought that was a great juxtaposition. You know, what does the customer get? What kind of entrance do they get versus the corporate um, higher That's up? Fantastic. You like that? Any That's premises fantastic. case. And this actually, true story, I was, this, this was done with Google Maps. And um, I thought if I needed to, I was going to fly to Memphis if we didn't resolve the case in mediation <laughs> to get a better picture of their entrance because there's no tripping hazards there. <laughs> there's no cracks. You know, there's no trash. There's no debris. They got a clear entrance. Um, so I, I thought it was a fun thing to show. We ended up resolving that, so I didn't get to use it, but I was ready to do it. So let's talk a little bit about um, the use of grids or the concept of a grid in presenting information and data to 
um, a jury or even a judge to uh, persuade them about something. There was a famous trial involving John Gotti many years ago, and there was a piece of evidence, a blow up that was used at trial that the jury requested re-examination. It was, it was this chart right here. And what it had was the, the, the defense put up the criminal activity of the government informants. And what they were showing the jury was, look, you got, these are the people who have testified for the government. Look at all these crimes and things they've been convicted of, including like pistol whipping a priest. You're going to believe these people to convict my client? And I think that's just a fun example of a kind of chart that you can build with the evidence to help the jury. You know, you're decreasing the cognitive load. You're not have to remember all these different witnesses and you help um, distill down the information to a digestible form. So let's look at a simple example with like damages. You can show the jury something like, you know, a simple um, question about what was the testimony about for past and future damages? Well, Dr. John Smith, who was our expert, testified our client is going to have past damages because of this and future damages. One of the experts they, they had said, well, I'm sure he had past damages. And yes, more likely than not, he had past damage, but there's no way that he had future damages. And their other expert, you remember him talk about how, yes, the client has is going to have future, but doesn't have any past. So ladies and gentlemen, jury, more likely than not, have we shown that both past and future damages, all we have to do is show by preponderance is simply more than 50%. And here two thirds agree <laughs> to past and future. And so if you present it in that way, it's a nice way to get the jury to understand how you, you can show it with a damages concept when you're showing preponderance of the evidence, or this is an example I used at a motion hearing to show a judge when I was suing Enterprise for a negligent entrustment case. And one of my theories was that they ought to have checked the person's driving history, which was horrible. And they said, well, hey, we don't have the responsibility and nobody else does it. And I showed the judge, and based on the evidence I had gathered, that all these other companies were checking for people's prior driving history and would exclude them for these kinds of um, bad driving events. And then only enterprise was not. And in fact, you see the way your enterprise is in the middle. I actually had at one point, I had it on the left, but then it sort of didn't look right. But I found, at least to me, it being sort of buried, in the, it made it stick out more what they weren't doing um, by putting it in the middle. And so I actually had this as a blow up. Well, I had a different one. I had this blow up at a motion hearing for the judge who could immediately get, oh, look, all these other people are checking. This is a question of fact, move on. Summary judgment's not um, going to be granted. So that's an example of using a chart like this, whether you're using it for a judge in a motion hearing to help the judge understand the issues or about the evidence or the jury. And let's talk about the rules that help you or allow you to do that. And depending on the state you practice in, at least under the federal rules, rule under Rule 1006, a summary of information that cannot be conveniently examined in court that accurately summarizes otherwise admissible evidence can be used in court and admitted as evidence um, under certain conditions. So basically, you can use a summary as admissible evidence. So... Imagine having somebody with a driving record that looks like this and saying to a jury, look how bad this driving record is. You know, they may or may not get it versus creating a graphic like this that says, look, let's talk about this person's driving history. In 2013, they were in two different collisions. They had two different speeding convictions. They had another collision. They had a reckless driving, and then they were in a collision on, the, on October 30th of 2015. And all that is summarized from the driving record. And so let's take it one step further and using a blow up like this in the video deposition itself to get the witness themselves to agree that all the necessary um, qualifications to make it an accurate summary are admitted by the witness to make this document or this blow up admissible. So here's in the middle of the deposition, I'm asking the driver if this chart accurately summarizes her driving history and convictions. Does this diagram accurately reflect the various 
collisions and convictions that you were guilty of during this two year time period? Yes. All right. So what I did with that was, and I do this in all kinds of depositions, but I, I use this slide or this um, video for a couple of reasons for you to take note. Number one, again, depending on the state you practice it in, some states require that the videographer stay on the witness's head and not vary from that. If you have a problem with that, you, know, you check your rules. But my position is if I could do this at trial, why can't I do this at a video deposition? So you may need to have a judge rule on it ahead of time, but you know, I'm just warning you, you check your rules and figure out a way around it because you can look at the power of it. That's number one. Number two, when I set this up with the videographer before we started videotaping, I looked through the lens and my iPad and my drink cup and all these other things were not in the way. He had backed out, he had zoomed out a little bit. And so now all this other stuff was captured. So whenever you are using a videotape deposition or going to make one, you need to take the time to put your eye to the lens to see what it is that's going to be captured and talk with the videographer or court reporter ahead of time to make sure what you want to be captured is captured. So now I saw Ginger pop up. So when this Ginger is, pops up, so I get quiet. <laughs> this is just, I, I'm enjoying this so much. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, um, Justin has also a law professor with the Charleston School of Law. Is that right, Justin? So I just, I just muted just, myself so I could do, yes. In fact, so I was supposed to be in class in about 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm taking in so much and I'm learning so much and I'm enjoying it. And, um, and the jokes are pretty funny too. Both you and, and Dustin are, are kind of fun. <laughs> but um, anyway, I just want to take a really quick second because I wanted to introduce everybody to Kim Ebersell who works with On Point Legal Nurse Consulting. Now she's in Florida right now. I know they're having some bad weather, so hopefully she doesn't cut out. But Kim, we're so happy that you're taking a moment to be with us today. Stay safe, you know, especially anybody who's there in Florida right now with the, um, the storm that's coming in today. So, uh, but tell us a little bit more about what you guys do because you have an amazing team over there at On Point. Thanks, Ginger. And the screen behind me is not Florida, by the way. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my, ourselves. On Point is a, a legal nurse consulting and expert witness firm. We've been supporting attorneys for 25 years on any cases involving illness and injury. Now I do have some bullet points here, so I hope I handle them okay. Um, but we have four programs to help you. So if you find that you're getting bogged down with complex cases, or maybe you haven't tried using nurses in the past, the nurses in our consulting program have a lot of experience helping attorneys. Um, they make the complex information simple. And they do this uh, with merit screens for med mal cases to timelines and chronologies that include our unique case analysis, which outlines the strengths and weaknesses. We also um, identify missing records, systems failures, red flags, and possible defense strategies. We also identify the impact of pre-existing conditions and can differentiate between new versus aggravated injuries. Our nursing home and long-term care program assists with anything long-term care related from simple thumbs up, thumbs down merit screens to specialized experts who are familiar with the standards of care. Our program coordinator um, is a clinical geriatric specialist and she has over 30 years in that industry. Our expert witness program provides experts in any specialty needed. They are all clinically active, they're located nationwide, and there's no cost to you for us to search for the right expert. For damages, we excel at quantifying damages with our life care plans and our medical cost projections, a lower cost option. For non-economic damages, our pain and suffering analysis helps to tell the client's story it quantifies what the client experiences, loss of mobility, loss of freedom, loss of independence. We pull that information out of the records for you to expand upon. So if this looks familiar, our goals are to make sure you are not blindsided, to avoid surprises and simplify the medicine. 
We're accessible, easy to work with. Feel free to email me if you have a case you'd like to discuss, and you can also submit your information directly onto our website. Thanks, Ginger. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you again so much for being with us today. Um, like again, both John Romano, myself, um, many other attorneys that I know, we love working with you guys and uh, you do such a great job. So definitely don't forget to put your information in the chat box for everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again here soon. Okay. Great. That, that thumbs up, thumbs down consulting is a great, great resource to get an early vetting of your case uh, early, early on. Uh, it's, it's a terrific resource you guys should take advantage of. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they do so much over there. It's pretty incredible. Um, but, but you guys were making me laugh about the uh, the bullet points because now <laughs> Justin has made me rethink everything oh, I, I do in the future, you know, with all my email blast. <laughs> but anyway, thank, thank you so God. much. And now I'm very excited. You guys get to, to meet um, Mike Seeley with HMR. You may have met him, was it last week, Mike, that we had you with us? Oh, a few times. Yeah, but we're really excited because Mike is going to be joining us in Santa Fe for our very first live seminar since COVID happened. Um, that's going to be September 19th to the 21st. So Mike's going to be out there with us. We're going to have a great time. Um, I've got more information about that seminar coming out soon. And then after Mike is finished speaking and when we're done with pres this presentation, we got four bags of this freshly roasted coffee that Ted Mullis is going to give away and one person is going to win. So very excited about that. Uh, but Mike, tell us a little bit more about what HMR does. Uh, thanks, Ginger. It's nice to meet you guys. Uh, I said, I'm Mike Seeley. I'm with HMR. I'm the Southwest uh, sales manager for HMR, I'm basically based in Texas, I cover some of the surrounding states as well. Uh, HMR is a uh, medical funding company. What that is, is we allow to be go out and provide medical providers for you so you can focus on what you really need to do to, to win your case. You're not having to track down different providers, uh, maybe outside of your state, maybe outside of where you normally work. Uh, we're able to go out and contract those medical providers to provide treatment for your clients, for your underinsured or uninsured clients that are out there. Uh, allows them to get uh, quick treatment. Uh, we keep up with the treatment regimen uh, and let you know if there's any uh, gaps in uh, treatments that may be detrimental to your case. And, uh, and we kind of specializes in more of the, uh, the larger types of, uh, of medical procedures, large surgeries, burns, amputations. And we have a real uh, strong focus on uh, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, I know there's some other medical comp uh, funding companies out there, but we're one of the few ones that do uh, traumatic brain injury and have a good understanding. Uh, we also have a division of our company that does pre-settlement funding. So if you have a medical provider that we can't work with, they are not willing to work with you guys directly on maybe a letter of protection, uh, we're able to advance funds that can be used either to uh, directly pay those medical providers, uh, can be used to pay uh, you know, large surgical deposits that, large, that uh, many hospitals are requiring now or can actually be used to uh, help the, uh, the clients pay their, their living expenses. Everybody's got, a, uh, everybody's got a mortgage, everybody's got a car payment. These are funds that are used to go to Disney World or you know, have a fantastic Christmas that year. Uh, these are people that are you know, at, at a dark time in their lives that, that really need a financial help. Uh, and we have a great program. And one of the things also that people seem to like, it's very simple to apply for. Uh, it's not a huge process. Um, you know, we go through, look at the merits of the case, and if it's there, uh, then we, we advance the funds. Uh, the money is, uh, is available there, and there's no reason for these people to have to suffer. And if we can help you out, pick up the phone, give us a call, shoot us an email, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody in, in person in Santa Fe. Thank you. Same here. We are really excited about that. And um, Mike, thank you for all the great work that you do over there. Um, We've done a lot of like webinars together on traumatic brain injury that anyone who's watching today, if you'd like to go back and look, go to our Connectionology YouTube channel. And um, we record a couple of our webinars and we do put them up there, but definitely go back because it's a great resource. And um, HMR does a wonderful job. So thank you so much, Mike, for being with us. Thank you. It's very nice right. to have everybody. <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna hand it back over to Justin. And don't forget, if you have any questions, get those in now, okay? Put them in the Q&A box for Dustin.
I know I saw it. A real professional. I was I was muting myself so I wouldn't interrupt them, and now I forgot to unmute myself. I, anyway, so um, well, I'm going to try to give you all a few more video deposition examples to try out, and then we'll talk a little bit about technology and see if we have some questions. Um, and if not, uh, I'm going to. One of the questions I always ask is, I'll send out the materials, I'll make them available to Ginger, or you can email me. And I also have a book list. People ask what kind of books I read about these various topics. I can send that to you. Anyway, if you start using blowups like this at trial or in deposition, you need to remember to mark an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that is the blow up with the sticker on it because the court reporter can't mark the blow up. I mean, what are they going to do with that? Or at trial, what, what are they going to do? So what I do is I always have an exhibit on the blow up and then add like an A to an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that is a reproduction. And I give that to the court reporter and I say on the record that we're marking a exemplar of the blow up as exhibit you know, 11A that the court reporter will keep and maintain. And I will maintain the original um, for trial or whatever it might be. That way, if there's ever a question, everybody knows what the exhibit was. So do all those things, put it on the record. Do you ever get objections from defense counsel uh, when you're trying to mark the blowups and how do you deal with that? Yes, I say your objections noted. I mean, whatever. <laughs> I was like, don't get caught up in that fight. Who cares? I mean, and I've, you'll see what, in fact, I'll give you one in a second. Um, I'll, let me show you. Yeah, I mean, just don't get in that fight. Who cares? I mean, yes, you've made it your objection. Great. We'll let a judge rule on it. Yeah, my, typically, the way I handle it is judge, I could do this at trial. I don't know if this witness is going to be a trial. Why can't I do it now? You're just like, well, why not? <laughs> anyway, um, but, and plus all that tells me is it's really effective. So I'm, I'm going to try to have more blows. So this is an example. Of my client was, oops, blows up. So my client was rear-ended, I claim, by a, by a police officer. And she said in her report that it was my client's fault. So this is me videotaping the police officer as I go through her dash cam <laughs> in real time in the deposition to ask her what she is saying. You, keep in mind, she's written out a report saying my client suddenly came to a stop and that's why she rear-ended her. So in the video deposition, I'm playing the video and then I'm pointing out that I got her to agree that the, you don't have to worry about the audio, but I got her to agree that she sees the light flashing, the turn signals on and I'm pausing it and then I'm pointing out that the brake lights are on, getting her to agree to that. And so, you know, so I get to all that kind of stuff and so I'm not gonna waste all this. So then she runs into the back of my client. So the case went from, it was my client's fault to, anyway, so that, let me go back to this. So I just wanna show you an example of using video in the deposition itself to cross-examine a witness, just like you might a trial. But you have to have the- Question, nuts and bolts. Is, was that done at your office or somewhere yes. else? that was in my office. Okay, so, so you had, had the TV already ready to go in your office. Correct. And I've actually, since that time, because of that deposition, I now have a bigger screen because I wanted to make sure that the video is um, visible. So I'm controlling it from my computer. I'm scrubbing through the video where I want it to be and then asking your questions about it. Do you see- my client's turn signal on. Yes. Let's count how many times the turn signal was on before. <laughs> Let's see. Was that one? Was that five or six? Because we'll play it again. Okay. Let's play it. <laughs> it was five. All right. Now you see the brake light on. Yes. So that brake light is on right now and you're not slowing down. Right. If you were paying attention, you would have seen the brake lights. Right. And she went. <laughs> so again, again, to me, it's an opportunity to be creative and have fun. So uh, that's a good question. And I, that's how I do it. I, I have a, a portable set that I take with me to depositions at other offices, mm -hmm. which is a 35-inch TV mm -hmm. and a, a small uh, table that's a, 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 um, just a, a pop-up table. They can all fit on a dolly. The 35-inch TV can fit through regular doors. Mm -hmm. And because when you show up, there's really not much room on the table usually. And so I have my own table and then stick the TV just like you had it as close to the witness's face as possible and capture both. It's helpful. I mean, just, you know, trying to think creatively about how you can um, use these videos to capture information 
And, and then here's another fun one to juxtapose something. You know, if you've got an expert witness who's making this kind of money, then why not have that as part of the background when you're testifying at the video deposition? And this is one you were asking a little while ago, Dustin, about uh, was there objections? The lawyer kept objecting. I'm like, this is a DeBenny essay deposition of your expert. I didn't, you know, you're not bringing him to trial. So I get to cross-examine him just like it was at trial. And if you're not going to allow me to do that, then don't use this video. And I'm like, oh, okay, just know my objection. So that's how I sort of handle that. So uh, let me get to a couple other things because I'm looking at the time. Instead of going through some more examples. Well, this is a quick example of a witness for AutoZone. I was asking him how safe the um, property was. <laughs> And he was looking at these pictures so the jury could see what he was looking at. Um, just given the time, and I'm going to skip over some things. And I'm going to talk a little bit real quick about um, some technology tips for planning for court. Go to the courtroom ahead of time with the equipment you will be using. Don't do this the day before. At least a week ahead of time, you know, check with the court staff, find out a good time that works for them for you to come into the courtroom and let them know if make sure it's okay to take pictures because it's going to help you map out the area that you're going to be working in. You know, plug in the computer, bring the computer you're going to be using at trial. Plug it in and see what works. Make sure you have the right dongles. Am I playing something? Do you see it or no? Not right now. Ugh, I didn't hit share screen first. Ugh. Sorry, that's. I had a feeling when my tools weren't there. Then okay, there we go. So. What I was saying is take pictures of the courtroom that you're going to be in so that you can plan how you're going to be presenting this information. So if you know the jury is going to be here and the witness is going to be here, if you're going to be using a easel or using blow-ups, where are you going to put them? Because the jury has to be able to see them, the witness has to be able to see them, the courtroom has to hear you, or the court recorder has to hear you. Plug in your equipment and test it out. Make sure you bring extra dongles to figure out which one works with the court's system. And I try to take a picture. Once I plug it up and have it working, I take a picture of the system or the way it works uh, and which port it's in, take a picture of how it's working so that I'll have that. Uh, and I try to envision, take a picture of what it's going to look like if I'm standing at the presenter table versus standing on the other side and map it out. And so to, to think to myself, how is it I'm going to be presenting this information? And normally I would go into more, but I'm very aware of the time. I always take a picture of the, I'll call it the, the ports and plugs that are available in the courtroom. So I'll know which pieces, what, what, I, what I have to work with. You know, make sure you have plenty of these dongles that you can connect up with the court's equipment. And what I'm going to do is, because I want to, I want to get, I think, again, I'm very aware of the time and you know, we may, we'll do another what, what I'll do is I'll see if there's any questions. I have more stuff to cover, but I don't want to, um, I'm, I like to be aware of people's time. I hate. And um, hey, Justin, Trip yes, wanted to know, can oh. you show the slide real quick where the money is behind the expert? Sure. And I'll make all these slides available. Yes, I can. Great. Da -da -da. Thank you. Share screen. And by the way, you guys, while Justin is pulling that up, he has uh, gotten out of it once again today, folks. So one? he's going to be headed to his class, but one How, day, how's that one? one day when we have him on the webinar, yes, we're going to have I'll, to do I'll his do the, magic tricks. I'll do magic tricks. I'll do one or something, but not <laughs> You're very lucky. You're very lucky. I was in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago and it was great to have real people to do stuff with. Anyway, I haven't been able to do that a lot. But anyway, so this is the slide for, I can't remember who it was, Trip. So hopefully that helps yeah. Trip. Um, yeah, Trip, he's a great attorney out of Mississippi. All right, so there's that one. And is there any other, uh, again, I'm gonna make all these available so you can have Adam um, and no problem with it. Let me stop sharing. So if anybody has any other questions, but part of, I, I could talk about this stuff forever. We can have a part two sometime and maybe Dustin and I can talk about how to use IPVOs at trial and how to use them in depositions for another sort of tech talk. He's got two behind him and but I won't be out there. I keep my portable one wrapped up with me and, and he's got his there. So <laughs> those are, those are, uh, that's a game changer. I, I, mean, I learned that from Mark Lanier mm -hmm. that the IPVO is just, it, it's the, I think it's the future pr trial presentation. Yeah. And, you know, even in depositions and I was going to be doing something. Let's try real quick. Just let's, for people who don't know, let's try this real quick. Um,
What I'm looking for is that's visualizer. So what you can do is this is the power of it. So I get to this. And Justin, while you're pulling that up, uh, sure. we had a question from Jeff Martin that came in. What do you use the light for? The, the blue light? thing. Yeah. What, thing. what do you use the light, those light for the blue things? Light for blue things. Where's the question? IPVO. Oh, that's what we're about to show. Oh, yeah. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Justin. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Justin found him in the back. He was holding him up the IPVO. All right. I was very confused. What you, yeah. What do you use those for? Well, what I'm trying to do, oh, I can put on. Let me get it on the Wi-Fi setting. This They're old you... school Elmos, but way better. Mm -hmm. Let me try to do this, put on the, there you go. Here's what, here's the, here's what it's for right here. I'm about to show you. So this is an example of, let me share my screen with this. Dun, dun, dun. You have to make the noise when you're sharing the screen, All right? So, so here's an example. This is my document presenter. So in real time, I can, Put down a piece of paper and in front of the jury or whatever it is judge flip through a chart i can in real time draw out you know here's the accident scene there was a collision that took place wherever it is here you know the collision was right here the car was going this way this one's going this way whatever it might be so it, it creates interest and one of the cool things you can do with the ipvo is you can use multiple cameras at once so you can present um in so you can have your box within the box as you're presenting information. So what we'll have to do is do a separate show on how to use that, um, how to set that up. It can be, it can work wirelessly, go directly to an Apple TV, all kinds of fun things. So that's cool. Let, uh, let me show one one thing that I've done in, in a uh, Zoom depositions. They're they're fantastic. So this is uh, the, the whole screenshot of the end product of the Zoom with me and a dependent doctor and doing this. I wrote, I drew all of this out by hand during the deposition, walked all the way through it, drew the graph showing the overdose of medication uh, in red. And then if you see there at the top right, uh, I've marked this as an exhibit. And then at the top right, Dr. Creation says, this is all fair and accurate. Uh, it was 1006. It's a summary of <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so a lot of cool stuff you can do with the IPVO. Yeah, IPVO is spelled I-P-E-V-O. So I'll put it out for everybody. It's we, we maybe we'll do another seminar on using that sometime. But again, I'm not being rude. A part of it is to not burn up all y'all's time. We're willing to keep it an hour and a half. Um, yeah, this is fantastic. And I'm going to email this to everybody after the webinar as well, so you can stay in touch with Dustin and with Justin and reach out to all of our great partners. Um, but we can't thank everybody enough for watching today. Um, and then I just want to thank you so much, Dustin and Justin, for being a part of this webinar with us today. I appreciate it more than you know. And I know well, that our attendees do as well. Thanks for having us. And also, I'm going to uh, bring in Ted real quickly because he's going to do the announcement for the coffee giveaway, someone is going to win. See, I can't even hold them all. There's like four bags of this freshly oh, I noticed coffee. one's missing already. There were four, now there's only three. That one, right? <laughs> Sorry to hold them. But anyway, it's fabulous coffee. It's a great prize. I know several people have been winning it. Don't worry if you don't win today, there's a chance to win tomorrow because we have another webinar at three o'clock Eastern time. Um, so Ted, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us who the winner is today. Welcome. Yeah. So I'm uh, excited to say it's uh, Francine Martin out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. So congratulations. Yay. Congratulations. All right. Well, we will both reach out to Francine after this webinar. So she gets this great coffee. And um, real quickly, tell us the special um, part about this coffee and all of the great charity that it, it goes towards. Because you guys have been doing this for a while now. And I know you're doing a lot of great work through them. Yeah, so uh, a portion of the proceeds of the coffee purchase uh, go back to the Peruvian communities that the coffee is sourced out of, um, and they're building schools in those communities. So it's kind of neat. It's coffee. It's uh, the schools that coffee built is what it's called. Um, so it's a pretty neat uh, just opportunity to give back to um, you know where the coffee is sourced from. So I think that's great. Fantastic. 
Well, we'll see you again tomorrow, Ted. And thank you so much for sharing the good news with everyone today. You're welcome. It's a great webinar. Thank you. All right, Dustin, Justin, do you guys have any last words? Good work with you, Dustin. Hopefully I didn't <laughs> derail you. Hopefully I said something that made sense. Absolutely. I, I learned a ton, Justin, and I hope to do this again. Thank you so much for, for sharing all this. Great, great stuff. Thank you all. All right. Bye, everybody. We hope you have a wonderful day. We will see you back again here tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us.